Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Open Building Institute webinar number two. Uh, last week we talked about the, the living building house, and today we're covering the, the aquaponic greenhouse. The schedule is on the, uh, on the OSC wiki. What I will do is I will send both this presentation, all the links and all the recording to everyone so you can refer to any questions that you might have. There's a lot of different links in the presentation. So let's begin. Open Building Institute, Open Source Ecology. We have teamed up this year to develop open source affordable housing. Part of that is the greenhouse. The Open Building Institute is dedicated as an open source effort to make ecological affordable, affordable housing, housing widely applicable, accessible to anyone, and that includes the greenhouse. So that builds on the work of open source ecology where we have been building various types of machines like the brick press, the tractor, everything else to apply to real construction, such as this greenhouse that we built in 2015. That was our first aquaponic greenhouse. That's what I'll primarily be talking about right now in terms of the results from that, because the second one, this is the recent build completed only three weeks ago. And in this build, we built the house in five days and then we built the greenhouse in another five days as an intensive immersion workshop and we had 60 people participate in both workshops so what we do in our program is do modular construction where let me enlarge this a little bit here modular construction where we build a large number of modules with, with a large team, such as the glazing panels, the roof panels, vented wall panels, and everything else. And we assemble them quickly into, into place. And that's how we're able to do this, this type of a five-day build of a greenhouse in a rapid fashion. So the modular greenhouse concept initially started as an experiment. And could we design a greenhouse that's only 800 square feet that can feed two people with a complete diet, not only just your vegetables or just the... Uh, uh, part of the diet which people typically talk about but going to the complete diet and so that's the experiment and we're really trying to push that forward so using efficient ways to grow food using the vertical space so the towers the aquaponic towers are one of the key elements that we use so we use a combination of fish ponds and towers uh, growing towers vertical space in all kinds of ways that allows us to pack in an extreme level of growing density into a into a structure, a year-round growing structure. So here you see the beginnings, very beginnings. It's a tractor, and that's the, the pallet of the 16-foot glazing pieces, which we then used to build this. Here you see people pretty much finishing up on the, on the greenhouse 2015 using the, the double-wall polycarbonate glazing. Here's what it looked like in April. This was before our Kickstarter campaign. Things are growing inside. And in the middle of winter, that is what we saw. So this is the classic picture from February. We planted, as soon as we built this greenhouse, from this place in November, right when we ended the workshop, we planted it up. So we, we grew stuff, begin growing stuff. And by February, this is what we had. And that's mostly here what you see as an overload of bok choy and lettuce in our vertical growing towers where we installed 24 of the vertical towers over a 30-foot pond we had two ponds in that system that's one of the growing beds that we we put in with some bok choy there lettuce strawberries um, onions and things but the idea was to use the aquaponic method and combine the productivity of fish and plants in one where the fish uh, excrete their waste and that waste water is used to feed all the plants. So into that system we, we attempted to do worms, black soldier fly larvae, where uh, we can eat the fish, we can eat the plants, the, the fish can eat the duckweed that grows in the vertical troughs, both duckweed and azola. Uh, we also added a chicken greenhouse there where the idea behind the chickens is that they can provide us with eggs year-round for the humans they also poop where the worms eat the droppings to make make vermicompost and we also tried 
uh, black soldier fly, which are detritivores. Uh, they eat uh, just about anything, so you can feed them a lot of different things that were used to feed the chickens. That experiment was kind of aborted. We still are doing the worms and um, fish, chickens, and the vertical growing and other systems. But the idea is that uh, we're trying to get as close to a closed loop system as possible in terms of all the ecology in there. So what you see in this picture is uh, the greenhouse. This was now about in May or June where we built not only the vertical towers where you see little plants, primarily lettuce growing in there, with the fish ponds right underneath where a continuous pumping, you see the black feed line, that's the water line that feeds to the top of the the vertical towers and um, water trickles through the the medium inside the the towers which is just a foam medium very lightweight porous material that supports the plant growth so here what we had is we planted 10,000 hazelnuts and chestnuts that's what you see on all the all the troughs on the walls the front walls and the side walls that's a big load of actually breeding grade hazelnuts because we're getting involved in hazelnut and chestnut breeding as perennial crops for perennial agriculture. So that, that was in the middle of summer. Since then, we have planted these out. Uh, but the idea here is you see the water trickling through the ponds. In the back there, you see, okay, one of the things that the fish need, the tilapia, they're a tropical fish, so we need they need an optimal of about optimum temperature of about 80 degrees so what we did in the winter we kept the temperature up the, the what you see back there those red tubes are actually hydronic heating lines which run from our stove this is actually the panel behind the stove we're running hot water we're running it through these pipes about 250 feet of pipe just coiled up around a 55 gallon drum that are in the water and that heats up the entire pond such that when we ran the house heating we were able to keep the pond 72 Fahrenheit all winter long. And we get down to zero Fahrenheit, down to negative 10 Fahrenheit here. And this ha the greenhouse never froze in the winter. Uh, there was one day we actually reached 32 Fahrenheit. That was the coldest day. Uh, the ponds remained at their typical 72 Fahrenheit temperature or so. But in, on a super cold day, we had a little bit of die off on tomato plants, but the bok choy and lettuce and everything actually came back. It was just a little nip. Uh, but the hydronics is a good way to go here because we're the, the idea for us is to have the greenhouse right in front of the house where in the winter, the greenhouse is reducing our heating bills. It, it's very hot. It provides the humidity and hot temperature. The, it's about you know 80 or 90 in there. And a on a sunny day in the winter so we're using that heat and we basically now have to heat our with our stove only about 50 percent as much on the days where it's super sunny we don't even turn the stove on it's it's warm enough from all that solar gain in the greenhouse now there is an issue that we definitely ran into with that because this this air here in this greenhouse you see all the water everywhere transpiration and the, and the water dribbling down the towers definitely moist like 100 percent humidity cl or close to that a lot of the times and what that does is it actually in the time right before winter which is about october november the humidity is actually intolerable in a sense that there's water condensing on our windows inside the house and everything else it makes makes food rot quicker so we actually have to address this humidity issue and we do have that plan we have a an idea for that for the next greenhouse which we just built which we are going to implement and I'll tell you about that in a second but basically we're going to go through a heat exchanger not blowing the hot air directly with the humidity but with uh, a heat exchanger which runs hot the water from the greenhouse which is actually heated through uh, through the solar gain and then you have a blower on a heat exchanger like a car radiator that blows air through the the exchanger so that we can uh... okay I'm gonna show my um, show my webcam here so that you can all see me here as well um, so everyone is still here
Okay, I'm assuming that you guys can all hear me. And we are good to go. Okay, so let's let's continue going here. In the so that's the heat exchange exchanger that we're installing in the next iteration. So this is a picture, you know, kind of going through the seasons. This was actually right in November when we had the the second build. And um, let's see, can everyone hear me still? Okay. Um, okay, so we started the aquaponic ponds with seven medium fish, which we dropped into the first pond here, and uh, that was our beginning, beginning of the fish population. But basically, the beautiful thing is, after some time, they do their thing, and we had a whole cloud, maybe 100 or 200 little fish swimming in a pond. So basically what happened is the pond took care of itself in, in terms of propagating itself, so right now, the first pond here is filled with about two or 300 fish that are currently about eight or nine inches long uh, from these that have basically self-propagated. So it's a self-maintaining system, though we do want to establish a reliable breeding system where we can on demand d decrease or increase the population. Like say after right after we harvest, we wanna make sure that we can bring a population back up. So we probably do, we do want to set up independent breeding tanks like, like aquariums. Because the idea is after harvest, uh, when all the fish are big, uh, if you were to put little fry in there, they're going to get all eaten by the big fish. The, the big fish eats little fish is correct here. So we either have to provide habitat where they can hide. Like here what you see is the actual, uh, you see the red in there. That's the heat exchanger coil inside the water. Actually, there's hiding space there. But at the beginning, there were there was a bunch of the big fish and these tiny ones, and they, they were able to hide. We, we set up a little cage for them, little protective environments there. But you want to be able to make sure that the young fish live. So and and you want to if you want to run an operation where you're controlling the numbers and actually can produce on a in a reliable way, then um, you want to set up an independent tank for for breeding them. So you have a reliable restocking population, say after harvest. Okay, and our idea was to do two ponds, and that was for resilience, and there that's actually troublesome, and we went to a single pond in the next iteration. So just to tell you what happened, if you look at right here, you can see kind of the ground is a little uh, indented. Uh, when you're experimenting with this, and you're running two independent pond systems, it's very easy at some point to mess up. Day in, day out, you're turning on the, the watering on and off. You're watering all the different troughs, uh, using up like maybe in the middle of the summer, we're using probably like 50 to 75 gallons a day from transpiration and growing all the nut plants. But at some point, you're going to get a leak or a mistake where you leave the pump on and the whole thing drains out. So we've managed to, uh, mismanaged to drain one of the tanks um, at least once and what we got here is even though these ponds are reinforced a little bit that we had a little bit of cave-in so because we know that everyone at some point might mess up even if you have automation uh, we decided to go away from this middle walkway so you have these two ponds one here one there but the idea is that if you empty one pond you have all the weight of that water from the other pond pressing against this wall, which here is only 30 inches wide, and that actually can put a lot of stress on that, I mean, tons of stress on that wall, and it makes it cave in to the other pond, and that's exactly what happened. So we had some cave in, a little bit of cave in, so we don't recommend this um, under the assumption that at one point or another, you're going to drain the pond by mistake. So... To, do, to get away from that, we, we were designing for one pond. That's what we built the last time. So another feature of this is, a, is, a, is of this greenhouse is a chicken house where we get, we get chick, chicken eggs uh, daily. They're still producing right now. Um, brown, <laughs> get brown eggs, green eggs, white eggs, tan eggs. So that's some of our crop um, from the summer. That's also some potatoes we grew in the greenhouse. Potatoes don't do really well because it gets too hot for them. Uh, but actually sweet potatoes do really well. We've had that. So we also did the, the mushrooms. That was part of the greenhouse. We planted five buckets up. We've documented the full procedure 
on a wiki you can link to click on this link here but basically what you do is use one way to grow mushrooms is to soak straw in water for a week until it ferments and then you put the grain spawn of the mushrooms in there you layer that into the buckets you poke little uh, half inch holes into the buckets and the mushrooms grow out of the bucket side so out of this five tower height of mushrooms we got 12 pounds of mushrooms like this over a period of 90 days that was when we planted them in november and we were getting them like in january and stuff uh, but the procedure is well documented on a on a wiki you can click on that including how you make your own grain spawn um, if you want to start with a vial of of um, inoculant or or the mushroom mushroom live mushrooms in a in a solution you can propagate them using the techniques that peter mccoy has has documented for us to do to do basically uh, to propagate your own mushrooms get the mushrooms spawn yourself in a kitchen environment by using these clean room techniques on your kitchen kitchen top so full details are on the wiki on that so how we typically start was what we did was we planted seeds in perlite for the plants that's perlite there that's that's uh, lettuce bok choy and kale in this picture here then we transplanted these into net pots that's where a little bit of 3d printing came in we took out the 3d printer and printed out a bunch of these net pots which go inside all these holes in the towers uh, so you plant the little perlite and the the plants in these little net pots which are one inch across just tiny little net pots you put them in holes in these four inch growing tube so that's what we're using we're using five inch inch sections of four inch diameter pvc pipe we make these what you do is you mark all the hole locations you use a chop saw to to make a slit then you heat it up with a heat gun and we have a whole procedure on that there's a wiki link um I'll, everyone will get access to this basically you stick a bottle into the slit that you've made and you ream it out after you've heated it with a heat gun and you get these nice structures they look like they're professionally made but that's just heated you cut it you heat it and you ream it out with a bottle and inside you see that that's the nature of the medium that's inside it's a foam type material it's reticulated foam the links for the sourcing on that are also online each piece of foam for a five foot length uh th these sorry these are actually three foot lengths cost a dollar 75 but you have to order it in bulk however but one one section of tubing the 10 footer costs about seven dollars at your big box store then you got uh for 10 feet and then you got a dollar 75 of this foam for each one of these towers and then you use hanger wire to hang this and the way you connect them together some of the tubing has belled bottoms so you can slip one into the other and screw them in or you can drill a little hole on the side and use hanger wire to connect the two pieces together so you can make a three foot tower a six foot tower right now in a old greenhouse the 2015 version we've got six foot towers what you saw in all the pictures and then a new new greenhouse that we built is a little taller it's actually that's one picture of the new greenhouse we're using 10 foot towers the full 10 foot lengths uh, hanging from the the ceiling um, now i want to talk about the hillbilly heater one of the big issues about uh, that we learned about the ponds are that the ground so the ponds are four foot deep over a meter deep they're reaching pretty much into that area of the ground which is about 60 fahrenheit year round so we have two inch insulation foam insulation underneath the the liner the liner is a double layer of 10 mil poly and that's worked well for us in the old greenhouse we've got that polyethylene layer there's the insulation underneath it and then the ground we we're just digging a hole in the with a backhoe in the ground before we build the greenhouse to build the ponds so we're not using tanks um, this way we're able to for about five hundred dollars we're able to build a three thousand gallon pond which would otherwise cost you a few times more than that if you get a big pond but our idea was to to use three thousand gallons so that we have ample space we can stock the fish at low density without you know without worrying about all the balance and all the things that can go wrong uh, we're trying to run it at a light load by using a large pool of water which is a good thermal 
uh, thermal properties it keeps the greenhouse warm and traps heat but we found it doesn't trap so much heat um, and that's why we're going to uh, basically right now without heating like towards the end of the the summer once it starts cooling off you're, you're going dropping right down to 60 fahrenheit even though in a greenhouse you could be 90 or you know it's really 120 at the top on a typical sunny day you'd, you'll get without with a, all the windows closed you'll get 120 fahrenheit this was just recently in november um, over 100 Fahrenheit towards the ceiling and 60 Fahrenheit at the at the bottom during the day when it's sunny. So there's all that heat upstairs, but nothing downstairs in the ponds. And because there's plants there, they're they're shading a lot of the the ponds from the direct solar gain. So if we didn't heat in the summer, you'd get close to 60, 60, 65, even in the summer when it's so hot in a greenhouse. Really bad thermal transfer. So to address that, we're using this hillbilly heater. Basically, you're, um, right now we're installing 1,500 feet of half-inch tubing in the greenhouse, which does direct heat exchange with the water. So you're trapping the hot water from the, uh, the, the heat of the sun from the top of the greenhouse. So there's both the direct thermal gain as well as some conduction because it's so hot up there. And we're pumping that water directly into the ponds. And that's our solution for the heat of the ponds because right now, uh, we've kept them about 70 Fahrenheit winter and summer um, in, the, in the hottest days of the summer without heating. They were no hotter than the, than the winter, which was the, the hottest I've seen it in the summer was 76 on hot days, but typically around 70 for the 72 for the Fahrenheit for the temperature of the water. So one thing we learned is that because these fish want to be more like 80 than 70, uh, every 10 degrees of temperature, you double the growth rate. So we, we could, in principle, be doubling the growth rate of the fish by using the hotter water. The tilapia are hot water fish. They grow fast at the hotter temperature. So that's a critical thing we learned we, we have to do. So using the towers that we do use, one of the issues that are actually catastrophic and which make the, the former greenhouse really impractical to maintain like our promise was 15 minutes or less of maintenance per day well the tubes at the top of the towers uh, you, you run little uh, eighth inch tubes into the top of the towers but they clog up all the time once the fish system gets all uh, fished up and the fish are pooping in there there's a lot of waste material floating in the water because these are the filters the the towers are the filter we are not actually not doing any other filtering outside of occasional watering of all the different plants that are in the greenhouse like for example in the summer we we flooded all the nut nut plants i used a lot of water so a lot of that fish waste also went into the growing troughs on the sides of the greenhouse but um, most of the filtration is occurring through the towers so they're going to plug up the little one eighth inch holes are going to plug up all the time so you can of course go to higher you know bigger hole like a half inch but then if you have 22 towers or 48, which we have right now, a 44 right now, that's a lot of water pressure uh, that you'd need to pump if you had half inch holes. So right now we're using a small 100 watt submersible pump with about seven gallons per minute to, to flood all the towers with a drip, but that gets plugged up. So our idea next is, um, is to go to automation actually and hook up a small number of towers like we're thinking about five and this we're currently working on this but basically use a large number of water solenoids and arduino controller microcontroller and little solenoid uh, valves that uh, so these are the valves these are just plain washer solenoids that you get from a washer and each one of them has two channels the water goes in there you can turn on one or the other automatically using your arduino microcontroller it's an open source controller you can use uh, solenoid drivers, these little switches that your little controller brain turns these switches on and off. So you, you want to do, say, maybe five towers at one time. You pump using a high-pressure pump, like a small diaphragm pump. It only draws like 20 watts or so. And, and pump water only to a small number of those, those towers at a time. About five is our guess right now. And what I know is that whenever those things get clogged up, I can blow through them and blow them out. And human breath is only like 5 PSI or less. The little um, 
diaphragm pump has 35 psi so that should with no problem blow any stuckage and that's that's fish waste primarily just little chunks of fish waste typically or anything else that gets into the pump uh, you can force that through if you have a water system that uses a very small pump and then you just switch a small section of your watering system on at one time now of course you can go to a huge pump and just blow force you know hammer through it using a large pump but one of the constraints here is low energy use as little energy as you can to water the entire system so right now we're using uh, currently we're using two 60 watt pumps in the next iteration we're actually going to the system that's going to feed all the tr all the hanging towers is going to be a single 20 watt pump a 35 a 35 psi small diaphragm pump that's dc running straight off the pv panels that we have and that will be enough so just 20 watts to water all your towers because we're switching from one one of them to the next basically switch at whatever pattern we want right now we're designing a system with 16 solenoids and 16 on and off banks so so if you've got with 16 solenoids and about 50 towers you can run three towers per solenoid but we also want to do uh, other things like one other thing that we definitely want to do for automation is watering the the chicken uh, the worms under the chickens in the summer it gets really dry under the chickens where they poop and there's the worm worm worms that live in there but it just dries out so much that all the worms end up reseeding and you don't get good good churn of the compost beneath the chicken coop so we're going to water that just mist it a little bit so the worms can come to the top and that, that the biological processes can go on there because otherwise the straw under the chicken coop is pretty much completely dry that's been our experience so we want to use the automation for that as well as well as for other parts which i'll get into the the duckweed troughs uh, which are actually a complex engine semi-complex engineering problem how do you um i'll talk about the duckweed troughs later here but okay so part of the nut breeding experiments here was um one interesting thing about 3d printing like i showed you the these 3d printed pots well when we did the if you go back to the very beginning where we have our our nut plantation here we're growing out 10,000 hazelnuts well in these pictures here those had automatic watering semi-automatic watering we basically filled the top trough i turned on a pump filled the top trough and then the water in the troughs on the side here the wooden structures that you see they would stay there for a few hours to get bottom watering to the hazelnut plants as you see the canopy of the hazelnuts is extremely dense and if you try to water from the top there's actually very little water that gets into the actual pots below so you have to do bottom watering and um, so you pump water to the top and you, and there's a special fitting that we designed on a 3d print to be 3d printed because it just doesn't exist the fitting allows you to fill up the troughs to a to for bottom watering but then it allows the water to drip slowly out to the bottom and in order for the troughs not to overflow when you're first flooding this you have a big hole in the top of this fitting so just to show you what i mean precisely um this is the fitting this is actually the fitting that's it's fully documented you can actually download the 3d print file but a fitting which allows you uh, uh basically to clamp on to the troughs it's a basically um that's the where the wood of whatever troughs you have or whatever container you have you got you got a nut that screws on and you grab onto a piece of wood there's a there's a washer rubber washer i just cut out uh, it's a threaded fitting that allows water to spill over the top and go over the top to to flood the bottom more of the bottom troughs because there were three layers so the water was flooded into the top troughs then it just overflowed into the the two layers below through the big opening in this fitting now you want that water to leak out of that over time so there was a little tiny weep hole towards the bottom of this fitting where the water would drip out over like a few hours so that's an example where 3d printing is actually quite useful because you can't get this type of fitting it, this system of, of planting those 10,000 hazelnuts would have been really hellish if i had to water that i mean i watered it every other day um so and it would take an hour and a half to water everything by hand 
so I'm saving all that time. What I did was just flood, turn on the pump, it would drip, drip into the top, con top. So just to explain, because this is actually quite useful for anyone who wants to do this, you you flood the top layer, it drips down to the second layer, then to the bottom layer, and then it overflows back into the ponds. So just by turning the pump on and walking away, I was I was confident that all the plants would be watered and then just come back in to turn the pump off. And that's also something we want to put on a timer so you don't have to worry about doing that or forgetting that if you're very busy. Okay, so that's the special water fittings. Okay, some of the things that don't work. Uh, let's talk about some of the problematic issues. And um, the pH balance is a critical issue that you got to con concern yourself with in a, in a system like this because the, the fish and the water system tends to make the pH around more like 8, p 8 pH with all the biological activity. And plants like more of a pH 5 or 6. So there's an in inherent battle going on in the pH level that the plants want plants want something different than the fish and that's one of the challenges of an aquaponic system so what we're doing to address that i don't have a picture here but we use the the same little pots that we used to plant the hazelnuts to put soil in there and then stick that whole little pot into the hole so instead of using net pots we actually used uh, like six inch deep pots with with soil so that the the growing plant would have the ability to um, well basically you're decoupling the water system from the soil system so we're doing somewhat of a hybrid between a water-based system and a soil-based system by incorporating soil within the tubelings where we now uh, what we're doing now is using the 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 little net pots we're putting perlite directly into them, putting the seeds into those, and then transplanting the net pot into the deep pot, the little uh, little propagation pot that we're sticking into the tower so the plants are actually growing in soil. Now, the next iteration of that is, of course, well, if we did all those hazelnuts like we did, um, why not plant the plants, the little lettuces, right in the same pots that we used for the, 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 the hazelnuts? Those are 100 plant trays. You see a little bit of those with the white pots there. Um, and that's fully documented once again on the wiki about the sourcing for those. Plant the seedlings of the your food crop directly in those and then put them in the towers. So how long does it take you to do a, plant a seed? A second or a few seconds. How long does it take you to transplant it into the towers? Another few seconds. So that could be a really optimal way to plant, you know, plant, you know, 15, 20, 50 plants a day. Um, and then transplant them directly into the towers in their final pot. And, and therefore, you're also addressing the pH issues. Because right now, we, we pretty much don't measure the pH anymore. We're just saying, for, forget that. Let's, let's give the plants a little bit of a, a soil buffer so that they're not living with the pH of the, of the ponds. And to date, we haven't figured out how to keep that balance yet. I mean, you, you do the various additives to reduce the pH. Uh, but then we did that. Like, for example, we put... Uh, vinegar <laughs> is one way to do it and then but the pH so it went down to your six or seven uh, about seven pH you want to keep it about seven neutral to as an interim between that was a good good balance but then again it just the day after a few days after when it went back up to pH of eight or eight point five so we said okay forget about that now we're planting things in pots and then planting the little pots uh, like you see here, wait, here? No, no, not in this picture. Uh, I might have some pictures later. So let's continue about the different techniques. So there's the, the automation, there's the 3D printed fittings, there's the some chlorosis issues, uh, nutri plant nutrition issues from the plant plants. We've seen really good success with the bok choys, the kales. They always grow. Um, Pesto, pesto, what is that? Basil grows really well. Uh, a lot of the greens grow really well. But uh, we still have to get a balance for, like, the lettuce right now is not really growing well for us right now. While the, the kale is growing excellent, the lettuce is not. Uh, that's definitely a trouble spot. Um, aphids are a big issue you have to deal with. Like here, oh here, a little integrated pest management. This is the praying mantis. You see this load of um, 
pests. You got you see our aphids here, but this mantis might be taking care of them. I haven't seen it in there, but we we put that in the greenhouse when we caught that during the workshop. Uh, integrate pest management. You got tree frogs that are in there and, and toads, also. Uh, these, um, but what happened with these? We released these just about two weeks ago. They munch down all the aphids. You see, I think the dead aphid bodies on a, on the leaves here. But now I don't see a lot of them anymore. I don't know if they went to hibernate or they're not. Um, there or they ran away. I mean, maybe there's some holes in the greenhouse that we're missing. But that's an issue that um, we're we're facing right now. Definitely, there's a lot of aphids right now. And that's why we got the the ladybugs. Uh, we planted a whole bunch of Napa cabbage. It's growing well, except for a, for an aphid infestation. Like here, you see. This is arugula. This does also have an aphid infestation. And last, uh, towards last winter, last January, when we had the bok choy, the beautiful uh, load of bok choy growing, the, aph the aphids were decimated by the, the ladybugs. I mean, the ladybugs propagated like crazy. They were all over the place. Like each plant would have a lot of, a lot of your ladybugs and ladybug larvae and eggs. And we had no problem. But right now we're actually, I don't know what happened to the the aphids. Here's some other pest damage. These are these little beetles that look like Colorado beetles, but they're not. Um, so that's pest integrated pest management is definitely something you have to master, and it's the whole balance of what what's living in your soil, like what what you're keeping around, like the ladybugs. I'm, I mean, we're hoping that we have a constant population of them so they can do their business. Uh, on the nut population, we had a major major outbreak of uh, fungus gnats, and we took care of them by getting a shipment of parasitic nematodes that took care of those but we lost about 25 percent of the hazelnuts so you're talking about like like a like thousand or two thousand of them uh, because we had ten thousand growing we lost a large number due to fungus gnats which we took care of with parasitic nematodes which we just sprayed onto the plants and into the soil and that took completely took care of the the nema the the fungus gnats but we do see some fungus gnats around they're they're still around now here's the going to the next greenhouse here we have the what you see here is the new build with the 10 foot tall greenhouse here at the back it's 10 feet the walls are eight feet you see the towers that are not hung yet but here's the pond we so in this house we're actually doing an autonomous system on water both water and energy so we just dug a this is just from a couple of days ago um, a 30,000 gallon pond right southeast of the greenhouse which will provide the water both for the aquaponics and for the house after a filtration system so we're experimenting with an, a completely autonomous water and energy system in the in the greenhouse so um, the big question that we asked ourselves at the very beginning of this experiment is is a crazy productive greenhouse like this, which you know we're seeing some evidence of, of good productivity. The fish, we haven't harvested even one fish yet though, and we did have rabbits, which um, one of them ran away and we didn't have success with that. We gave that up uh, primarily because my partner didn't want to eat those because they're furry. So that's one of the you know human issues are also there. Like, you know, are you um, eating your animals? Uh, is that acceptable to you? That's um, If you want a resilient greenhouse, you do have things like chickens, chicken eggs, rabbits. There are possibilities, but for those who are vegetarians, that may not be an option. But just to talk about the energetics, uh, can you feed full uh, full diet to two people? Well, let's look at basic principles. In the greenhouse that we built, which is 800 square feet, you're getting about 70 kilowatts of solar input. And the bottom line is, do you have the first principle solar energy to f to produce that food that we as humans are eating? So we go to plants. They can trap about 1% of that solar energy and convert that into plant biomass. It's the lettuce. It's the, it's the potato that you eat. So that's about 10 watts per square meter at optimum efficiency on average for average plants. That means you're trapping 700 watts of food energy as the maximum possible if you used all the space in a greenhouse. Now that's at 1% conversion rate. Now there are plants that are more than 1%, like two, three, four, five percent like like I believe sugarcane is like in a 5% or so for the conversion rate of um, solar energy into plant mass or the sugars in the plant. But say you have 700 watts of income coming in, 
Well, an average human uses 100 watts of power. So if you were to, to take that food that you grew in a greenhouse, you can in principle, well, you have to, you can in print, let's say you can in principle su support a human or two, but you also have to consider that the sun doesn't shine at night and we need food and you know, we use energy day and night. So you really have to half the 700 into by two, like if, if half the day is, is day or even by four, if you've got the, you know, this, you know, essentially like six growing hours, you're in the Northern climates or something, but say you have, you know, 12, 12 hours of sunlight, maybe, um, but you still have to half that 700 Watts by two. So, so half that is 350 Watts of available food energy that you have. Well, if a human uses a hundred Watts, that's marginally, you know, two humans would be say, uh, 150 each, 100, 150. So two humans would be about 300 watts. So in principle, it's if you if you're growing, you're you're trapping the energy and, in the plants, and you're eating the plants, you can in principle get a full full diet. Now that's assuming that you're not putting in any extra food into that system. What's food like? Chicken food, rabbit feed, fish food. If you add those into the system, then it's pretty trivial actually to get your full diet. So the question becomes, how do you generate the animal feed? Well, how, why do I say uh, it's easy to get all your food from that greenhouse? Well, just have a bunch of rabbits in there, have a bunch of chickens, um, have a bunch of fish. Just just take the fish. In a 3,000-gallon pond at low stocking efficiency, you can stock 300 pounds of fish very, very easily. The fish growth rate is 1%, so you're getting 3 pounds of fish mass per day. Now that's enough to feed um, pretty much a full diet for a person. Can you survive on three pounds of fish? Yeah. Energetically wise? Yeah, definitely. So if you're adding the chicken food, you're getting eggs, you get, you're adding rabbit food and you're possibly getting rabbit meat. Uh, it's very easy to load the system with external energy and then a person could get a 100% diet from that by harvesting that. But the question is, can we do that without um, trapping outside energy? So, so we're experimenting on that. And one thing you have to ask is, okay, let's talk about uh, how do you trap that most effectively. So I just talked about the fish yields. 300 pounds of fish mass in a 3,000-gallon pond. You can see the tilapia fish. So who feeds the fish? Is it the algae that are growing in there? Well, let's talk about uh, mushrooms also. Let's, let's bring the mushrooms in because... Uh, our yields have been from the five buckets that we planted. We we got 12 pounds of mushrooms over 90 days. Um, now out of a, a square foot because they're vertically stacked, that's awesome. 12 pounds of mushrooms is not bad for a one square foot footprint, and they're 30% they're protein as far as the mushrooms go. They convert the straw, which looks like it has no protein, into a, a substance that's 30% protein. So that's extra food but let's talk about how you feed the fish you can say feed the the mushrooms to the fish but let's talk about duckweed and azola which we think has a lot of potential so this is our new floor plan that's a new house that and greenhouse that we built 3600 gallon pond right here there's the 30,000 gallon pond that i just showed you the picture of um that that's nothing there but basically it's a house greenhouse combination the back wall of the greenhouse is 10 foot tall so let's look at the yields of duckweed that we can get from that if you do, um, what we're planning on is four-inch troughs, essentially gutters. Um, so you go to the big box store, get yourself some gutters. They're $4 for 10 feet. We can put in 10 rows of 30-foot long gutters in that system. So you're talking about each gutter gets you about one square meter of solar capture. So you got 10 square meters of solar capture area in those gutters. And... 100 grams is the harvest rate for duckweed. It's a, it's a prolific growing uh, thing. Duckweed orizola, about 100 grams per square meter per day. So we're talking about one kilogram harvest of duckweed per day, which is really significant production. One kilogram for the fish. That's pretty good. Um, you can see the duckweed orizola pages on the wiki, but there's a little trick duckweed hydraulics problem here. Uh, if you're going to harvest those 10 rows, that's like by hand, that's like impossible. So how do you harvest this efficiently and automatically? Well, one way to do it is once that goes back to the automation. So you, you pour in water 
into troughs in a controlled pattern. So, so say you flood each of the troughs with a bit of water so that the excess water dribbles down through downspouts directly into the tilapia ponds. So if you flood each trough a certain amount at a regular interval, you can be flushing some of the older duckweed down, down the gutter, <laughs> literally down the spout, so you're feeding the fish through that but that would require some timing issues and really getting that down we haven't done that but that's what we're planning on if we're going to make this efficient we definitely want to put it as part of an automated system so as far as closing the loop i do think that is still possible if you you don't even put any external uh marginally i mean if you don't put in any external um inputs like like fish food or chicken food or anything else for example if you if you make a pond in front of the greenhouse to reflect more sunlight at the greenhouse you can add your efficiency a little there we're not talking about uh, LED lights that you can use to to grow more food I mean that would be cheating that's another input um, but definitely you can get a full diet off the 800 square feet very it would be very hard to do it if you just rely on inherent energy though it's I mean that's what we're looking at I mean really experimenting with what What's the limit with all the gutter, gutters for azola and then the mushroom growing and then the detritivores, your worm towers. Uh, we have a bunch of worms, worm bins that are stacked vertically. So imagine closing the loop between the human, all the wastes from the humans, the kitchen wastes, possibly the biodigester waste, with, which we have, uh, which we are building into this house. If you include, start including the detritivores and growing things like worms, like red worms, or other critters that feed on dead matter, like mushrooms that feed on dead, dead biomass. Um, you can definitely talk about harvest having plenty of uh, nutrients in there to f feed a person. Um, and we're just trying to see what the limits are in terms of feasibility. In the summer, you can have an outdoor pond where the fish can you can transfer some of the fish into an outdoor pond because it's hot in the summer here. So that's another way to increase your growing area. If you talk about the area surrounding the greenhouse immediately, um, then you can harvest the biomass there. I mean, your grass clippings for uh, rabbit food or other plants for for animal feed. Uh, I think one good way for just that's robust just about anywhere is um, if you have a pelletizer and a grinder. You can take straw and offal, like a butcher shop offal, which is high nutrient waste from, from butcher shops. Grind that up together into pellets um, and make your own fish food. Now, that's essentially what, what fish food is. They grind animal byproducts and some biomass like corn or other stuff, uh, other grains. And they, they, that's what fish food or a lot of the other animal feeds are. They're recycling animals. <laughs> is not not so great but i mean you are recycling it's uh it's not not too bad um, but if you combine the duckweeds and the gutters red worms and vertical towers that you can get huge productivity out of the towers i mean you know one square foot but you go vertically that's a huge growing area um and th but then for red worms you'd have to talk about well how do you harvest them effectively so that it's not a chore that you can actually manage that within a short you know within a day's time <laughs> So you're, this is not a chore, but something that you're just pre pretty much harvesting. You have to automate that somehow, have a worm collector somehow. Um, grass and hay from the outside of the greenhouse, outdoor pond integration in the summer, algae, bioreactor, which we're still working on. Um, we haven't implemented a, any algae growth. We, we are trying to do spirulina as a human superfood um, in the greenhouse as well. We haven't succeeded in that yet. So all in all, uh, we're very optimistic this was the recent build we are as happy as that about it we're going to add all the 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 automation in there the hillbilly heater we're running directly off the pv panels that are behind there so a lot of the fans water pumps and everything else that can be done in the daytime we're planning on running everything in the daytime so we use minimal power overnight so that we literally can get away with hardly any of a battery bank to, to power up the house because we're running all the loads in the daytime. So various strategies to do that. But one major issue that we're running into, you definitely have to have circulation in there because right now I don't have a picture here, but I mean, we have uh, mold growing on some of our plants right now in a greenhouse because it's really humid in there. 
and we're not running fans in there. In the summer, we, as you see in this picture, the bottom of the panels is openable and the very top is openable. So we have a natural thermal siphon happening for cooling such that in the summer with, uh, you know how I mentioned it was super hot at the top? Well, in most of the greenhouse, it was just about as hot as outside because you get that constant airflow just passively. But now we closed up the greenhouse because it's closed up all the vents because it's cold and now we're getting mold problems. So we actually definitely have to, definitely, definitely have to add fans which we didn't notice last winter because there was nothing growing last November. We just started the growing in November, so we didn't run into that problem last year. But we're very happy with the openable windows at the bottom and the top, which gets you a natural circulation. But right now we're going to run little um, DC fans, which are bilge fans from boats, 12-volt fans or 24-volt fans directly off the PV panel so that, so that in the daytime you're blowing air around you definitely want to have a lot of airflow in a greenhouse absolutely we thought we could get away without that just by using the natural ventilation but in this in the winter when you close up the greenhouse because you don't want your heat to leak out uh, you definitely need fans and one last comment on this um, the fans are a necessity uh, the major improvement we need to trap the heat from the top of the greenhouse and put it into the ponds and hence the hillbilly heater that we call it we're going to have a heat exchanger that's another hillbilly heater at the top of this greenhouse uh, which is heating up water in the daytime and then using a radiator that's inside the house with a fan behind it to blow hot air minus the moisture into the house so that's our strategy for for this time around in this this new construction now i mentioned that uh, just one one more thermal uh thermal design point in this greenhouse we have a brick wall about eight feet of brick wall it's a thermal mass back there so we're using that for heat absorption and slow heat release the other thing is i mentioned in the summer um and even in the winter with the with the w windows closed you get 100 and above at the very top in the summer at the front south section at the top where you don't have the, a lot of the airflow that gets really hot over there i recorded up to like 110 or so in that area up there and, and the nuts that were there they could actually sustain that as long as they had water but some of them actually dried out and we had a little bit of loss because the plants at the very top here at the front did not have enough water though um, it was not the temperature i checked was, wasn't the temperature, it was a lack of water that um, that killed off a few plants. Uh, but other than that, um, um, we're quite optimistic about the future on this, and we're just getting this started, putting in all the towers. We're going to fill the back with the Azola duckweed troughs. The front will have, on the front and sides, we will have troughs for uh, growing beds, so we could do things like root crops. We are going to put in a chicken house once again here, the vertical towers for worms, so we can process all our, recycle all our wastes here. And um, that's, a, that's some of the main points. And definitely automate this because our goal is still 15 minutes or less per day of maintenance so that we can harvest all this crop. Right now we have plenty of uh, kale and, and lettuce, arugula. Uh, we have actually eggs are still coming, but not fish yet. So we are getting a decent amount of food from the greenhouse, but definitely, I mean, nowhere near complete or anything like that. Uh, but we're working on that, and I invite anybody to to replicate this. The What we're going to have is January 20, I believe, is going to be a next webinar on the design of the house and greenhouse. There's going to be one session, one webinar session, where you learn how to use Sweet Home 3D, which is the open source 3D CAD for interior design, which we're using to design all of our houses and greenhouses these are all panels these are four by eight front wall panels for the greenhouse there's four by 16 roof panels this is a mod complete modular building system that we're improving and adding on to so you can download all these these parts and design your own greenhouse and then you can modify them but to learn how to do that we're going to have a webinar on that so you, right now you can download all the files in sweet home 3d so you can make your own designs. Uh, but anyway, we're quite excited about this and maybe I'd like to open this up to any questions. I'd like to wrap up here and take a few few questions. Um, 
I do see a question here, 700 watts and 100 watts per what time frame? That is a rate, so that means uh, joules per second. So that's whenever the sun is shining, um, you get that rate of energy flow. Uh, so the question that you might be asking is what hours, which is at the what time frame you get that for. So uh, over, say you got six hours of light during the day, um, you would have... 100 watt times six hours, so 600 watt hours. Uh, that's energy. The 100 watts, the watt is a power, which is a rate. So that's a little different. But um, from first principles, it's marginally possible if you're absolutely efficient at trapping all that energy and cheating a little bit by using your saprophytes like your worms and and mushrooms that eat dead stuff that already has trapped solar energy and that you can collect from elsewhere, you can definitely get your uh, full diet. Um, I mean, you have to get really smart to do that, and you know we're no way near there. We're just saying we're trying to open up the limit of possibilities to people to think that even such a small greenhouse could provide such a substantial part of your diet, and we're just pressing the limits of that. And the definite key to that is using the vertical space. Um, without that, you wouldn't get anywhere. Uh, what are the costs? The cost for the first greenhouse was $6,000, about $4,000 for the, the greenhouse structure and pond, and $2,000 for all the other systems. There were chickens, and we put in uh, the black soldier fly. We actually had aquatic worms uh, in there, system two. Uh, both the aquatic worms and the black soldier flies we gave up on. We, we're not doing that right now. For the, the aquatic worms, we we're not sure about the yields. For the black soldier fly, uh, it was kind of uh, more infrastructure that you needed. And we didn't really get the full open sourcing of the effective propagation methods for how to run um, black soldier fly propagation in a really reliable way. Um, so this greenhouse, the new greenhouse, which is actually 500 square feet, that cost us a little less. There was a bill of materials cost for this greenhouse of $4,000, including the towers, including the pond. And the pond costs you a few hundred dollars in excavation. You have to rent a backhoe. But other than that, it's um, just a bunch of lumber and a little bit of insulation. And the biggest cost is the the double wall polycarbonate glazing which a four by eight sheet of that cost you about fifty dollars forty five dollars at menards now part of this development with the open source material production facility is that we 3d print our own thermoclear glazing which is polycarbonate a thermoplastic so we're currently working on a 3d printer that's scalable that we can do that with and at that point you can get scrap polycarbonate which you can either buy off the shelves, you can do thing, things like you can grind up CDs, which are made of polycarbonate, and other things are made of polycarbonate to make your own 3D printing filament. And that's the route we're going to ex to basically make our own greenhouse glazing from the scrap waste stream from waste plastic, which polycarbonate is a waste stream plastic. So that would reduce the costs down way more. And uh, actually, for me, what I do believe in a lot is you got to go underground. Think about 60 degrees Fahrenheit when you go four feet down or so year round. So the pit greenhouse idea is definitely a sound idea. In that, in that place, you have to have significant moving, earth moving equipment, your solid excavator to dig all of that area. But after that, you basically need to cover the top. You're reducing your greenhouse glazing costs. You're just opening up the top to, to the solar income. And you basically got a hole in the ground that's much warmer. Because think about that. On a cold day, you could be negative 10 Fahrenheit here. Compare that to 60 Fahrenheit. That's a 70 degree Fahrenheit hotter that you have just by using the earth as an insulation when you go underground. So there's huge thermal efficiencies that are gained if you go underground. But I guess... Why doesn't everybody do it? I think it's probably for the, the cost of excavation, how easy it is to do that. That's a lot of work. And uh, to stabilize the walls, um, it's probably a bigger upfront investment. But over time, when you consider the lifetime and all the energy that a greenhouse would use if you run it year-round, then you definitely went out in a pit greenhouse scenario. So 
what was your greenhouse pounds per per 800 feet don't have that number and it's it's not any high um, first of all we used most of the space during the summer for the nut propagation so all the 10,000 plants that was not not food growing space as far as the lettuces I mean the bok choy that you see in that picture I mean there's hundreds of pounds there we you know we gave most of it away to to the animals and and ate a bunch of that but we didn't harvest a lot at all because we're first of all we're just starting up so we don't have reliable data on that outside of we got 12 pounds of mushrooms from our five buckets that's one number I can give you uh, we're getting we were getting an about four eggs per day from five chickens throughout the summer and right now it's tapering off so there's definitely abundant eggs abundant greens but we're just we're not marketing that yet and the next goal is to show a commercially feasible operation a small CSA that can be run out of this and that's where we would get more numbers but we sorry we don't have the data right now to to brag about yet um, that's part of the ongoing experiment and we really need a full-time person on that to make that happen we don't have the energy here uh, we're very busy with all the other stuff between open source ecology and open building institute so we're we're going to work on defining a project proposal for a replicable community supporting co community supported agriculture operation so we're going to be looking to recruit somebody to do that on a full-time basis next year so that's one thing how many man hours of labor for each greenhouse if one were to pay someone else to build it well I would say um, if you look at 60 people over five days over say uh, probably six hour days 80 times six that's 500 hours per day <laughs> times five days 2,500 hours that's I would say at a very inefficient rate well 2,000 hours let's say um, that would be a lot of money if you paid somebody 10 bucks an hour 20 bucks an hour that would be uh, 20 or 40 thousand uh, dollars but that's that's considering the workshop scenario where most of that time is not spent working most of that is uh, it's an inefficient you can call it an in, it's inefficient for the amount of people we have because we're doing education at the same time and teaching people how to do that but I would say probably six people um, in five days you could probably build one with a crew of six people so about 30 man days or so um, six people times eight hours about 50 hours per day times five days say 250 hours so however much you're paying for that maybe 20 bucks an hour maybe five thousand dollars that's my my basic guess on that uh, if you had to hire somebody to do it so typically uh, the costs are if you're building it yourself the materials are half and build costs labor costs are another half so that kind of makes sense about five thousand uh, dollars the first greenhouse cost us six thousand in materials the second one four thousand in materials so about double uh, the materials cost so any other questions that we might have okay um, yeah so what I'll do is uh, I'm going to post this online definitely for for any of you who are watching it. we are gonna release that at a later date for the general public for right now uh, you can have a copy of this to review and I'll send out all the links to the different uh, topics we talked about today um, yeah you definitely whoever came in late or missed this you will be able to see a, a rerun of this on video we're recording this and uh, other than that we'll open up a discussion underneath once we post the video for the public we'll, we'll open up comments underneath that so people can ask more questions but we do have links within this presentation I'll send you the presentation which is uh, I mean I've got a bunch of links within the presentation it's actually a Google document an editable document uh, I have a number of links on the side um, and I'll send you this presentation so you can definitely
catch up on anything that you missed. Um, so, yeah, with that said, I think I'd like to wrap it up here, unless there's any more questions real quick from any people in the audience. And thank you for listening. And we'll continue the webinar series uh, back in January. We're taking off for the winter <laughs> right now. But back in January, we're kicking it back in with uh, about 10 more webinars on all other topics related to the Open Building Institute and low-cost housing for everyone. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.